Freeman Boat Works and Trilogy Outdoors are proud to announce the addition of Freeman Boat Works to our family of incredible partners. Billy Freeman and his team at Freeman Boat Works epitomize the American dream. From building the first boat in Billy's backyard to a 150,000 square foot state-of-the-art manufacturing plant over the past 15 years, they are building one of the most sought-after boats in the U.S. and beyond. These incredible fishing platforms are built in South Carolina and are second to none in stability, speed, and performance overall. These catamaran designs are engineered not only to get you to the fish fast, but comfortably too. Years of refining designs and pioneering the modern performance fishing catamaran is why Freeman Boat Works is the number one choice for some of the biggest names in the fishing industry. If it's long runs in the Gulf or the Carolinas, or days you can go fishing in South Florida when most center consoles stay at the dock, Freeman Boat Works is at the forefront in all categories. For more information on Freeman Boat Works and their six available models, visit www.freemanboatworks.com. Redefine your expectations. Michelob Ultra and Myrtle Beach Wholesaler, Southern Crown Partners Incorporated, know our consumers enjoy relaxing days on the water with Mick Ultra's crisp and refreshing taste in hand. It's important to remember to drink and boat responsibly. Choose to be or to designate a sober skipper before leaving the dock. Do it for your family and friends, your passengers, and everyone else on board. Michelob Ultra salutes all all sober skippers who take the pledge. Cheers, and we'll see you on the water. In Myrtle Beach, you always go at your own pace. Lie out on the sand, lie out by the pool, go boogie boarding, go surfing, walk the boardwalk, walk the marsh walk, golf at one of 90 golf courses, mini golf at one of 50 mini golf courses, fish off a pier, fish from a chartered boat, Go shopping, get drinks, eat the freshest seafood. The list is exhaustive, but the experience isn't. You can go all out or do nothing at all. How you relax is up to you. There is so much to do and explore, whether you're traveling with friends, family, or just yourself. With 60 miles of beach, you're going to find your place. If this sounds like what you need, then this is where you belong. Hey, do y'all like fishing for prizes? Maybe a trip to Costa Rica or a once-in-a-lifetime African safari? Well, the Grand Strand Fishing Rodeo is back. Thanks to the hard work of Visit Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and Trilogy Outdoors Media, this once popular event is back and it's bigger and better than ever. This event is comprised of 12 monthly competitions that culminate in November with our annual banquet and expo, the celebration of fishing on the Grand Strand. New to this event is the freshwater division that will help include all of of our anglers that live and visit the Grand Strand throughout the year. Monthly species winners will receive great prize packages from Bass Pro Shop and Surf Signs and Designs. But most importantly, they will receive an invite for them and a guest to our annual banquet and an entry in the grand prize draw. So whether you fish the rivers, a pond, the pier, the surf, or a boat, you have a chance to win the grand prizes. To get signed up or for additional information, visit TrilogyOutdoorsMedia.com and click on Event. Also, you can visit any of our way stations and registration stations to get signed up as well. Best of luck to everyone, and we'll see you at the scale. Trilogy Outdoors. All right, folks, here we are once again with Trilogy Outdoors podcast coming to you from the deck at Dead Dog Saloon. And today I am joined by a past guest on the show. Who joined us via phone once, I think, and then you you did sit I with did us. A live one over. You did a live one over at Jason's. Yeah, Jack. That's right, and that is the voice. You recognize that voice. That's the one and only Captain Bouncer Smith, and uh, Bouncer's joined us, and we have brought in his connection to the Grand Strand. Well, the son of his connection to the Grand Strand, Chris Conklin of Seven Seas Seafood, is here with us for a little while. He's got to go man the. Man the ship at Seven Seas here in a little bit, so he's going to take off. But we did have a wonderful breakfast here at Dead Dog Saloon and a wonderful conversation that we probably should have been recording most of the conversation. <laughs> That's and why I was that, pulling out the isn't headphones. That, I, was I like, know you we got, need to be recording all. This. I know you got the headphones out, and isn't that that's always the way it works. Yeah, and but it's hard to have uh, corned beef hash and, and uh, with the microphone at the same time. Yeah, it's a little challenging. Well, we have had far worse things touch this microphone. Well, well Chris is testing it now. <laughs> yep, look, there we go. See, he can eat. He's eating some of his hash over there. Good. But Really good. You know, Bouncer is a retired 
Boy, that must be nice to say. Retired charter fisherman. Oh, it's terrible, believe me. Oh, yeah. I, can, I'm, I follow you on Facebook, and, and I can tell you that retirement has been far from terrible for you. Yeah, but you don't see the six weeks that I didn't fish. Mm. You only see when I go fishing. Well, what happened with those six weeks that you didn't fish? What was going on? Well, I live in Marietta, Georgia, and my fishing buddy up there broke his wrist. Uh Uh-oh. So I didn't have a fishing buddy, and my sister's grandson, who is my other fishing buddy, he went crazy and went back to school, of all things. I mean, you know, it's just terrible they have to go to school up up there in Georgia. Oh, yeah. But uh, the bottom line is I think I went... I think I went fishing once in six weeks. Well, you... I, I go with uh, Doug Youngblood there on Lake Lanier, and I grant you, we had a great time. We had we had a uh, bunch of striped bass and uh, spotted bass, and really, really, really good time. Well, the freshwater. Did you grow up freshwater fishing, or? Well, I was born in Michigan. Okay, that's what I thought. I and I caught more. my first rainbow trout when I was seven. I caught a couple rainbow trout. And then we moved to Florida, and in Florida, it was a lot of saltwater fishing with occasional freshwater fishing until I got to be about 12. And, you know, we grew up in a different time where uh, you went out the front door at sunrise and you had to be back by dark at 12 years old. Yep. And by the way, take your little brother with you, who's only eight, uh, so he can go fishing with you. So we had... Uh, a canal uh, half a mile from the house with big old bluegills in it. And we didn't catch any bass back then. We caught big bluegills. And then we had a bunch of real small rock pits. Uh, fill quarries uh, where they were harvesting dirt right. to raise the land so they could build. And uh, they were full of bluegills and bass and Lots and lots of snakes. I don't know what kind of snakes they were, but we would catch bluegills, and we would want to save them for bass bait. Right. And these were just little bluegills, three inches long, and we would put a whole bunch of them on a stringer and hang it in one of these rock pits, and you'd go back to get your bait, and there'd be three or four snakes hanging from hanging your on stringer. It. Yeah. Oh, boy. It was crazy. But Oh, boy. Well, so what? I grew up doing a little bit of both. Well... What is your, uh, what's your best, uh, so you mentioned striper. What's your biggest striper? Oh, my biggest stripers were not caught in Lake Lanier because Lake Lanier had a tragedy several years ago where they got a parasite in there and wiped out the striped bass. Now, all those bass are hatchery raised. Right. So they shut down the hatchery supply till the parasite killed all the striped bass, and that killed the parasite. And now they've reintroduced striped bass, and this year they're getting some 20-pounders, but that's about it. In uh, in uh, uh, Cape Cod. Oh, yeah, now we, we're talking we caught, salt water. We caught some real nice striped bass pushing four feet, and I caught some real big ones in Montauk uh, pushing 40 pounds. So. Well, they say that your stripers at Lanier – and the stripers on Cherokee Lake, and the stripers on uh, uh, Davidson Lake, or whatever it is. I- any striper is going to come back with a DNA to stripers from Santee, from Lake Moultrie and Lake Marion. And that came about because of the damming up of Santee Cooper, the area. And they dammed it up at the time in which the stripers were during their uh, spawn. And once they did that, there was your saltwater stripers that were landlocked into freshwater. So they started taking those fish and using them for brood stock to share throughout the world country. Because they were extra tough. Exactly. Yeah. You, you talk about something interesting. When you think about what stocking has done... You know, the brown trout are not native to North America. They came from Europe. That's crazy. And and striped bass from the East Coast or Santee Cooper, somewhere on the East Coast, somewhere. Right. Are everywhere from uh, from the East Coast all the way to San Francisco. 
in the ocean, in the Pacific Ocean. That's right. And they say they have to come by here at some point, but we don't care. You know, I mean, Chris, you've been here your whole life. I, I mean, I know some people that have called them. It's always been like somebody, oops, look what I called. And, and I know that they've been called emeralds in it, but I've never heard of anybody like per se targeting them here to, to you know, try and catch one. But you have to think we're not far from where that incredible striper bite is right up there in North Carolina. Well, Merle's Inlet is a very unique situation. I was just in the Little River, which is, what, right. 30 miles up the coast or something like that? Yeah. And I was with Jake Jordan the day before. And Jake Jordan was telling me about how fantastic the striped bass fishing was in the Little River years ago. Yep. So I said something to Buddy Love yesterday, Buddy Smith. I don't know how I got the name Buddy Love. But at any rate, he's a... He's a a guide service owner up there in Little River. And I mentioned that Jake Jordan used to catch a lot of striped bass there. And he says, oh, yeah, we still get plenty of striped bass. So Little River has a river right. feeding the inlet. Yep. Georgetown has a river feeding the inlet, et cetera, yep. et cetera, et cetera. Merle's Inlet doesn't have a river feeding the inlet. Nope. So it's a unique situation, and it might be why the striped bass Hurry up to go past here and don't hang out. Yeah, and, and that little river fishery, I have gotten to catch one. I've caught one up there, and it is amazing. They how, must be thick if, if he caught one. Hey, I was with somebody that knew what they were doing. <laughs> I went back by myself to go try and do it and wasted a day. But there is a great striped bass fishery there that they keep completely quiet. And so they do with Georgetown. Georgetown, Georgetown. Yeah. You know, they, they apparently were selling the lures at Tailwalker Marine in Georgetown that they were catching stripers with, and the old guys went in and said, stop selling those here. Get them out of here. This is years ago. Get them out of here. We don't want people to know. But they were trolling between the bridges on the PD uh, side. They were trolling between those bridges. With like planers and bent butts. And bent butts. <laughs> and <laughs> catching them. Yep. And catching stripers. So, How big and then fish the, were they catching? The big ones. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll try and find a picture from Captain, uh, what's his name? Captain Shaky. Captain Robert, um, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was, I'll, I'll try and find a picture of his. He had one over 35 pounds. Nice. Yeah. So there's some big ones, but a lot of small ones, too. And and the ones in Little River, I heard you struggle to get one that's over 25 inches or legal, but they do catch a lot up there. But that that's great. I, did, I can't believe Buddy even, what's the name of Buddy's charter business? Let's promote uh, Captain it. Smiley's. Captain Smiley's. That's right. That's he, perfect he took name. The name. Perfect yeah. name. Yeah. He is, he's got yeah. a hell of a grin. He is, he's such a great guy. Buddy is such a great guy, and I know yeah. we're, we're going to always talk about him when we have you. You know my story about Buddy? Um, I, I don't know if I told him. Share before. it again on how y'all met. I know he came and did a trip with his, you in his, Florida. His father booked me to take him on his birthday to try to catch Pee Wee World's records. And... I think the first time we went, we went for tarpon part of the time. We waited till the tide was right. But our, but bottom line is, is we did catch a world's record tarpon. And and with the junior records, you could weigh it and release it. So I found a picture, our buddy sent me a picture recently of a buddy's dad with two boga grips in the mouth of a tarpon standing up on the covering board of my dusky, weighing a tarpon, standing with two boga grips and trying to read two mogul grips while he's holding up this 96-pound tarpon. <laughs> wow. And we weighed it three times to make sure we had an accurate weight, and you had to combine the weight of the two boga grips. But uh, that is crazy. That, that's unique. But, that's but unique. here's the crazy thing about it. This is, we're talking about an eight- or nine-year-old boy. Yep. And now he's probably 35, 31, 32, uh, 32. 33, somewhere in there. Yeah. I don't think there's ever been, in all that time, ever been three months that he didn't call me to see what was going on in my life. Yep. Every, it's usually every month. Hey, I just called to see how you were doing. And uh, just through the ages, it's really been an honor to know him. He's such a He's great, a great man. He is a great young man. And I said yep. kid earlier, but he is a great young man. I love, uh, well, we, we reach get, out via text about every. Month to two months as well. well. We get to be 85 years old like you, uh, Yep. 34 as a, as a kid. That's right. It is a kid. Yeah. No doubt about it. When and is your 86th birthday? Next week? Nope. Nope. <laughs> December 18th. 
December 18th. December 18th. He's going to be 86. I can't That's Sagittarius. Wait. I'm a Sagittarius. You yeah. are too, right? I'm Aquarius. You're Aquarius? Yeah, we're supposed to jive. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. boy. How's Taurus? We were opposite up? sexes, I think. What are you? Taurus. Oh, Taurus. Wait, when was your birthday? April 29th. That's right. You're in April. You're not May. What are January. You? January. Oh, you are. That's right. Hmm. Well, I tell well, you that's what. That's really critical, important stuff to a fishing This is a, for oh, a yeah. fishing show. We need to talk about that because, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, well, is, does that fall right under the lunar table? Is that. Uh, is you it? took the words right out of my mouth because we were talking earlier and, and you were talking about something. I don't remember what it was, but I said that the reason the fish started biting and quit biting was because the moon rose. Yep. And. Over 50 years ago, I was at the Castaways Charter Boat Dock, and one of the boat owners there owned three boats, and his wife got Alzheimer's, so he sat in his condo right on the ocean, and every day he would come on the, v on the it wasn't VHF then, it was AM radio, and he would go, okay, guys, the moon's going to rise in about 20 minutes. Make sure you got good baits out. Don't be moving. This is when you want to be fishing because the fish are going to bite. The moon at the horizon, I can't tell you how many times I have predicted the bite by when the moon rise was. You know, I was hard-headed about it. And I, I don't know if you want to call it hard-headed. I just didn't think it was that important. And honestly, I would say it was probably 10 to 12 years ago. I was spending a lot of time driving deer hunting to Lake City, which is where I hunted. And one day, somebody said, did you see any squirrels feeding yesterday when you sat? I was like, no, I didn't. I never saw one freaking squirrel. I never saw a deer either. And they're like, I want you to go look at the moon phase. I want you to find a major, and I want you to go sit in a deer stand. I don't want you to worry about whether it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon or whether it's 6.30 in the morning. I want you to go sit during the major. Oddly enough, it was at 1.30 in the afternoon. I got to Lake City at 11. I got on my camo, went and got in the stand, sat up. And I'll be, I saw more deer between 1 and 3 o'clock that day than I had seen any morning or afternoon sitting. Well, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you how far back it goes. You asked me earlier whether I was a freshwater solar fisherman. And then when I was around 8 to 12, we went to Lake Okeechobee a lot. And we'd be driving to, to, the, to the fish camp, and the cows would be laying down. And my dad said, well, I'm sure glad we're not fishing now. The cows are all laying down. And we'd be driving the next time. He'd say, boy, we got to hurry up and get there. The cows are all standing up and feeding. And he was watching salooner situations yep. when I was a little boy and didn't even understand what was going on. I don't even think he knew what was going on, except for he knew that if the cows were feeding, the fish were feeding. Right. That's a great. And, uh, hey. So we got Chris here for a reason, and I know he's got to go to work, but I want I want Chris to share. You know, you've had the fortune of your dad was was infamous in, in the fishing world as well and, and obviously fished with Bouncer here. They worked together and, and everything else, but I know you've got some great Bouncer stories, and I wanted you to share one or two or, or you know, I know Bouncer's meant a lot to you um, through the years, and, um, you know, share some of your 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 thoughts or stories on Bouncer. I know you've had some great fishing trips with him, including a swordfish or two. Yeah, so my dad uh, always always said, Dad, let's go back down to Miami. Let's go down there where you were raised. You know, he said, oh, I'm not never going back to Florida, son. I, you know, have no interest in it. I, I turn, turn, turn back. I'm never going back there. And, uh, I always wondered why, and I, I still never really got the answer, but... Uh, Later in his life, I was able to uh, connect with Bouncer. I reached out. I said, hey, Bouncer. I said, this is Chris Conklin. I'm Phil's son. You remember Phil? Oh, yeah, I remember Phil. <laughs> Phil. And uh, he said, yeah, come on down. We'll, we'll go fishing. So um, I booked some plane tickets and uh, didn't tell my dad we were rolling until, you know, a couple weeks before. And he he wasn't working so much back in those days anymore, so i never seen him so excited. And then we, uh, I think the first trip it was uh, me and old Ha Ha, David yep. Westfall. Um, we 
took a spirit flight down to Lauderdale, rolled that son of a gun through the uh, airport in a wheelchair, got him up in the, you know, Stanton Marriott high end right on South Beach. Oh, boy. Yeah, we didn't have any business in that place. <laughs> uh, we rolled down to Monty's Sunset at the Miami Beach Marina. You go to the marina and there's, you know, 150 yachts and, you know, a two three million dollar sport fish was a you know fly on the wall down there <clears throat> walk up and there's no charter boats i'm like where the hell i think we're at the wrong place dad and here comes bouncer pulling in with this big old ugly visor on and he's sitting there and he's barking orders at ab his mate no billy was his mate at the time and they're back in the boat in and uh evan Root always gave him these engines to try out and try to blow them up so he turns around and he, there's a small crowd of people. Everybody's watching Bouncer come in. Uh, Jose Canseco was in the boat slip next to Bouncer, as a matter of fact. Uh, famous ba- baseball player. Um, but Bouncer comes. Pedro will never forgive him for that slip. <laughs> so uh, Bouncer comes in about 6,000 RPMs in reverse and cuts it off and sits there and smiling, drinks his Diet Coke. We bring Dad down and it's like, you know, and we had two tall Willie with us too. I think. Uh, yeah. Um, Willie Humphreys, and uh, it's like none of them ever missed a beat. It's just instantly talking smack and uh, sitting there watching. We met Billy and Bouncers. Just he's got his his dogs trained. Billy's sitting there, and Billy wasn't probably your sharpest mate of all time, but he was pretty damn good. He was real. I was observing and learning and admiring. You know how. Well, well trained bouncer had his pet, <laughs> and uh, met Billy. Man, made lifelong friends with him. Uh, went out and had some epic fishing trips that week. We caught a, you know, I think bouncer sort of didn't maybe maybe didn't pioneer, but really figured out daytime sword, sword fishing. fishing. Um, you know, dialed in on it, and we went out and did that and caught a. I don't know, close to a 300-pounder that day. Uh, phenomenal. We caught seven or eight sailfish. My dad sat on a jump seat beside Bouncer's uh, console. The Dusky had a, a flip-up seat, and he sat there, and uh, we were kite fishing. And I think my dad called every friggin' bite that came in. Called them all. He would. He's sitting on this bench seat, and that little flip-up seat I put on there, just so I could watch the kite baits when we were on a on a sea anchor, and and uh, Phil sat there, and every selfish that popped up, he saw it before anybody else. He was still had the eyes for it, boy. He was sharp. Yeah, but um, this epic day of fishing, day day two, I can't remember a whole lot other than uh, we were hauling ass, screaming through uh, whatever that bay is down there, in between the state park or national Biscayne park bay. or whatever. Biscayne. Yeah, okay, it was Biscayne. And uh, we see this little dinghy sailboat tied up to a, uh, a marker out in the middle of nowhere. And Remember I'm like, this is a rated G. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I won't go into no, detail. No, keep going. Come on. No, you're good over so here. We're screaming by a bouncer. goes, we can't slow down. It's only two and a half feet here. So y'all hold on in case I hit something. And we're screaming by. And uh, all of a sudden you see this sailboat, a little dinghy. Looks like it's back and forth, rocking. Slick calm, by the way. We get up there, and there's this guy and this girl, and they're both buck, buck naked. naked. I mean, and the, the poor old gal, she, all I got to say, she didn't miss a beat. We all hoot and hollered and screamed and waved, and she waved, and they kept on going. I mean, it was, I, I, guess the moon, I guess the moon was on the horizon for sure. We should have been fishing instead of riding is all I got to say. But uh, I'll be damned that was a good, a good memory. And, hell, she was a good-looking woman, too. Um, that's even better because that's that, – Normally, the ones you're going to see like that are not going to be the ones you want to look at. <laughs> yep, yep. It's you like, know that. It's like who would ever want to go to a clothing optional beach? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can tell you the ones that want to go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, so, yeah, they're 55-year-old men with a big pot belly. That's our uh, the day I'm talking about. We, we caught several dolphin that day, I think. Yeah, uh, that, yeah. Oh, wow. Big, big swordfish. The best, the best was when you brought down Henry. Yeah. And, uh, that was a good trip. Put him on the amber jacks and 400 feet of water, vertical jigging, and 
I th and hand cranking them all up. It was on amber jacks. Yeah, big ones too. I mean, 50, 60 pounders. Yeah. How many IGFA world records are you a part of? Uh, around 65 or 70. Lost track. God. I caught two world records myself that I registered, and a couple more world records that I didn't register. Just. For one reason or another. Do you know? Do you know that his boat now holds a world record? Oh yeah, for what? Oh, Will Sanchelli caught the world record unicorn file. Oh, yeah, fish. yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> now I remember that. Yeah. Oh, they're getting hey, listen, desperate, aren't they? Listen, some people are just out for world's records. I mean, at one time we held the world's record for Senate. You know what Senate is? It's a member of the Barracuda family. No. In Florida, once in a while, we'll catch these. You know, you picture a great barracuda is rough and tough. And, right. Well, a senate is soft and cushy and and usually under two pounds. And Oh, really? And a great grouper bait, by the way. But uh, but at any rate, we were fishing. We were supposed to be sail fishing in West Palm Beach, and we were blown out. So we were fishing in the uh, uh, Lake Worth, catching ladyfish and stuff. And we caught the world's record Senate. It weighed two pounds and two ounces. Uh, wow. Really, really a major accomplishment. I mean. <laughs> Sounds to, like it. You had to be there to appreciate it. Now, now in the <laughs> IGFA, do they, uh, they don't recognize any freshwater fish, or is it? Well, that's an interesting question. They do. And they had, they, would, they will accept any world's record, any fish. In other words, if you caught a, a uh, Chris Conklin fish in, in uh, Merle's Inlet and it was the biggest one that had ever been turned into the IGFA, it would be the all-tackle world's record for a Chris Conklin fish. And there's some parameters, like it's got to weigh a pound or something, and, and, and if it's real small, it can't, can't be on 130. Uh, but at any rate... You can establish a world's record. But several years ago, the powers that be decided to drop a lot of the blue collar species. Like uh, you ask about the freshwater, they went from probably, we'll say, 100 freshwater species to 30 freshwater species that they recognized for line class records. Right. So you can still have. The all tackle world record uh, spotted bass. Right. But you cannot have the two pound line class world record for spotted bass. For spotted bass. Because they don't recognize it. Now. And I'm just, you, interesting story about spotted bass. Spotted bass were predominantly located in the southeastern United States. Exactly. And then in Alabama, they had another strain of bass they called Alabama bass. And one of those Alabama bass swam over to Lake Lanier and got it on with a spotted bass. And that spotted bass went over and got it on with another spotted bass. And now the IGFA has disqualified all spotted bass world's records from the southeastern United States. Wow. Because... They may be interbred with Alabama bass, and Alabama bass get about a pound bigger than spotted bass. Wow. So what they're in the process of doing is readdressing it, and it's probably going to be spotted bass slash Alabama bass will all be one category. All right, so I'm a huge bass fan. Uh, uh, I follow bass fishing really good, really hard. So would that be what they call the mean mouth bass, or is that a different bass? Have you heard about the mean mouth? I've never heard of him. Okay. I know mean about mouth. the big mouth billy bass. Oh, the big mouth billy bass. <laughs> <laughs> I know about the so, guamba. Do you know about a guamba? Nope. That's a crossbreed between a hammerhead shark and a barracuda. So you got the head half of a hammerhead shark and the head half of a barracuda. And there's no way for them to release excrements, so they get really, really mean and ugly. <laughs> kind of like that jackalope. The Crazy. jackalope, yeah, <laughs> sounds a lot like the jackalope. <laughs> or the, you gotta watch the jackalopes; they'll stab you in the back when you ain't looking. Yeah, they will. 
they're they're scary. Yeah. Well, what's your next? Uh, so you just left. You were talking to us uh, with Chris. Well, uh, when are you going to get to fish with Chris again? Well, my adventure this time was, I live in Marietta, Georgia now. Yeah. Which is way too far from the ocean. So I drove over here to Merle's Inlet, and drove right straight to the Merle and Inlet Fishing Center to see if any boats were out, which there weren't. <laughs> Every time I go there anymore, there's no boats out. They're not out. I'm really worried about these guys. Well, it's always a Sunday. The whole town's out today. Yeah, well, yep. I heard all about that. But at any rate, uh, so I went fishing with Chris part of Monday and Tuesday. Uh, I say part of because... He has a family and he has a business, Yep. so it interferes with his fishing, which means he's got too much business or too much family. One of the, one of the two. Or both. Yep. But at any rate, we went fishing, and I got some lessons on bull reds, and I got some lessons on flounder. And I mean, I fished with some really great violent people. I fished with Chris Reagan and Jimmy Deaver and Caleb and Tommy. Tommy Warner. Warner and yep. And I, Chris Conklin even jumped on the boat one time for a minute or two. Oh, yeah. I also, uh, Tommy on Tommy's boat, I had a gaff run on the top of my foot. Yeah, but no. that was revenge. Yeah, it was. Because we, you were cleaning up the oh. deck when you were gigging flounders, and you couldn't tell his foot from a flounder. It was dark. I, I gigged Tommy's foot. The gig went all the way in the top of his foot about two years ago. And I'll be damned if one... First time I ever got on that guy's boat, Bouncer and I are out there, and Bouncer goes, oh, I got one, I got one, and a little 10-inch flounder, you know, like, and it he gets so excited about order. it. Come on. I, I ran up to the bow, and I, these boots I'm wearing right now, my, it's a complete stop, and I look down, and that gaff is sticking in the top of my damn foot. Oh! It was mounted, you know, in a rack that's yep, kind of hanging rack out. rack with the point out. I got my rack on the side of the boat, which everybody better buy stock and tennis balls or something, but. Mine was right straight into my shin bone. Yo. But uh, Tommy, Tommy oh, couldn't hurt. believe I toughed it out the rest of the day. I, I had him pull the gaff oh, out I mean, of my it was boot. Blood ro- overflowing out of the top of his boot. I had to elevate it. And 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 and, and it was gruesome. God. We had it went t- through the boots. We had to tie his dude. F- we had to tie his foot up to his neck so it wouldn't. Oh my down. gosh. No way. He made this big play about bad batteries. He took the boot off. He couldn't he couldn't find a mark on his lily white foot. He couldn't find a mark. I got so lucky. I I I pulled Tommy's leg so damn hard on that. I think he still thinks I had to go to the hospital and get oh, tetanus shots and everything. Yeah, I, but I got lucky. The trip he talked so much about how bad he was injured. I got so lucky. It, yeah, you did get lucky. It didn't even pierce my skin. Wow, I worry about that. That, that and the tennis ball thing is awesome. Well, I'll tell you the worst one that we all do. And I had a guy get hooked in the ear. Hook in the ear? But we all use plugs with multiple treble hooks, and we don't pay much attention to where we put them when we're trying to make room to cast and all that stuff. When you use those multiple hook treble hooks. You need to have a lure package over it, or you need to put it up on top of the T top. Yep. Because I've seen this guy got hooked right through the ear. Of Walking the, around the console. A Bahamian native. Oh, really? Hooked right through the earlobe on a multi trouble hook plug on my boat. And you see guys with great big rapplers, great big rapplers with. Great big treble hooks on the side of the console, just waiting to snag you as you go by. Yep. You got to think about where you put those things. I, I, I hate to brag, and I'm probably safe now because the statute of limitations is probably out. But I was in the charter boat business and head boat business full time. How many years? 54 years. The only injury that we had that resulted in medical attention was on a boat that I didn't, uh, I was a mate on 54 years ago and a kid fell down and hit a table. But in 54 years on my own boat and on other boats, that was the only injury. That's awesome. That is good. People don't realize, I mean, Chris now, I mean, you've got, Chris has got commercial boats, multiple. You've got 
charter one charter boat. boat. Shrimp, two, uh, shrimp one, boat. One charter boat, right? One charter boat. That's plenty. And, uh, you know, you do worry about things like that. Oh, you yeah. Worry, you worry about people getting hurt on it because, oh, definitely. you know, I, I'm just going to say this. You know, a guy gets hurt on your charter boat. He's got, let's see, Chris and Gene Conklin. He's got 7C Seafood. He's got that beautiful yellow fin. He's got all your commercial boats. Well, He's got a lot to go after. Yeah. Yep. That's I mean, why they we do. Got, keep it all isolated, <laughs> yeah. baby. LLC. Say, yeah. LLCs, baby. But, uh, you know, the the commercial captains, uh, you know, they they live out there so that sometimes they stay, you know, get impaired while they're out there or whatever, you know, have some. No. Do they get impaired? Have a couple. I did not know. Have a couple commercial chili, fishermen? Have a couple chilies at the end of the they day. They get you know, impaired? Whatever. Here and there. And, um. You know, but I gotta be proud of my guys, Captain Red and Captain Andy. They they brag about being the safest, the safest boats in the whole fleet. They, I, they say, boss, we have safety meetings three times a day, morning, noon, and night. So don't you worry about it. We got this. And to this day, I gotta uh, admit, I mean, they might have crashed the boats here and there a couple of times, but uh, <laughs> no major injuries. You know, no no loss, no no casualties. I'm gonna tell you. Red has threatened multiple times to come on our other podcast. And uh, oh, he, the, the, the foul language. Express? Yes, the Captain Spilonius. He, he, he wants to very badly, and he's got two, uh, a, a mate of, or, or his second mate or first mate or whatever, and another captain he wants to bring on. And I'm like, I had him on the radio show one time. You know, I interviewed him. He's a great interview. I'm not going to lie. The guy does. He's very smart. He he's very knows, witty. He is very smart. He is very smart. Don't let him fool you. You know, a lot of people, unfortunately, you know, I think back to the days of this restaurant opening up, and I was here managing, and we had, I don't even want to, I've got, I know Charlie Campbell still has the picture. We have a picture of a commercial fisherman who is alive and uh, still, but we have a picture of him passed out in the bathroom on the floor with, with a needle in his arm oh no that's not my guy unfortunately i know that's not your guy <laughs> but you know we had a rough crowd back then we back were next the door oh, yeah. we were next to a different seafood store i mean a different commercial <laughs> you know who i'm talking about we were next to a uh, uh, a different place and uh we did get a rough crowd in here and you know the old joke in merle's inlet was uh, there were signs at different places that said no white boots allowed oh yeah no yeah. white boots allowed and that means for anybody that doesn't know, that means the you know, fishermen all wear white we boots. We all wear white boots. No. Well, not Chris. Chris wears camouflage. He's got those high-dollar camouflage. I, I, I got these at the end of the season. What do you wear? Tennis shoes, right? I wear s- sneakers of some sort. Yeah. yeah. So right now, right now, I have to tell you, right now. Now, do you like the sneakers that George Pavaramo gets y'all? Because doesn't that, he get y'all? That's an interesting question. George has gotten us different shoes on many occasions. Yes. But last January... For years, I had problem with one toe on my right foot, like the middle toe. Gave me a fit for years. All different styles of shoes and everything else. All right, but Chris, take care, buddy. Chris is, Chris it, is it, leaving it, us. We hate I'll to have you leave. I'll see you in an yeah, hour. Man. You betcha. I'll All right, be there. It's good to have breakfast with you, brother. All right, and uh, so... George got you some, uh, yeah, because so, I know George so, likes to take care of you guys and get you shoes. Well, his sponsors want us to wear their apparel. Right. So Columbia came out with these blood and guts uh, bungee cord, uh, don't have to tie your shoes, shoes. Right, yep. Well, George gave them to me about January 20th, 2023. I have never... I have never worn another pair of shoes since. Matter of fact, I've been meaning to uh, call him and ask him if he can get wrestle me up another pair because they got to go bad sooner or later. Well, he needs to get you. Uh, are you not on the list for next year? Because I heard he's already named his list for next year. No, I'm not on the list for next year. Okay. I didn't uh, know if you are going to make the Saltwater Series because that is a great that is a, oh, it's it's, a great deal. It really it is. is for a fisherman. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what. There's a couple of things in life that are don't ever miss out on them. George Poveromo's seminar series, which I think nowadays is about $75. Yep. And it's basically from uh, 9 to 3 yep. with a lunch break. But 
every 30 to 45 minutes, he brings on a new panel of four expert fishermen to talk about it'll be inshore one time or offshore the next you know session inshore offshore uh, here it would be red drum and then blue marlin and then it would be flounder and it would be uh, mahi mahi and then it would be groupers and snappers and but and you get a whole bucket of materials and supplies That's and right. equipment and his raffles, which are just door prizes, are off the chain. Oh, yeah. I mean, they electronics are. and and fancy coolers and Papa's Pilar rum. Yeah, and, the rum. Bring it on. If 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 if, uh, if his speakers don't drink it all first, because they got to get loosened up to be able to give away their secrets. But, yep. And and it's just phenomenal. I've done a lot of them. You have done a lot of them. You traveled during around. COVID. He went to TV shows in lieu of seminars. Right. And I did a couple of those. That's where I got my Columbia shoes. But. Uh, and that is that is that not. What, where did you sing? Didn't you sing a song or something we talked oh, about? Oh, well, we were in uh, <laughs> Chicago for the world's worst seminar. Right. The world's worst seminar. Yes. Yep. Not not the not the quality of the talking. But what happened was, was that. George Poveromo and Mark Sosin were partners in this seminar series with Saltwater Sports and Magazine. And the outdoor writer for Chicago said, hey, guys, come on to Chicago. I'll promote the heck out of the show. We'll pack the house. <laughs> so they rented a big hall. They flew in speakers and tech people and all that from all over the country. Because this was going to be in Chicago, so it was very diverse, and including me. They were desperate. And, uh, and then the outdoor writer got, had a heart attack. So he was out of commission for several months. Oh, no. So he never promoted the shore show. So here we are we're in this big hall with red chairs, red Just velvet chairs. And there were probably 30 people involved in production, and there were 46 people in the audience. In the audience. And fortunately, they got a couple of walk-ups in the morning, so they might have got up to 80. Chicago's not the place that I'm going to spend money to go host a saltwater seminar, though. Well, you might be wrong, though. I'm sure there's a lot of people there that travel and do charters and such but that's the whole thing the concept was that with the promotion of the local authority on fishing right chicago people are inland and they're desperate to find out about going fishing i'll give you an example mark Sosen was supposed to do a work at an outdoor show in chicago where all the vendors it's like a boat show or like a uh, it's an expo and all the vendors have their booths there and you know come to this Canadian lake come to this Mexican resort come to Florida come to here all those type of places and all the lure manufacturers and all the talc masters so it was in the south side of Chicago so Mark Sosen was supposed to speak there but he was double booked he was supposed to be somewhere else at the same time so he asked me if I could cover him in Chicago. All expenses paid, a good deal for me. So it was in March. I went to Chicago. I was representing Penn. I went to the Penn booth. And the guy meets me in the uh, 9 o'clock loudspeaker, 9.30, whatever it was, comes on and says, uh, at 11 o'clock, Penn will be hosting Mark Sosen on the stage. And the pen guy says, oh, I gotta go correct that. So the pen guy goes over to the announcing place and he says, uh, Mark Sosen wasn't able to make it. We already notified you that Bouncer Smith was speaking. And they said, well, who's Bouncer Smith? And the pen guy's never met me. He said, well, he's a guy from Florida. I don't know. So uh, 10 o'clock, the announcement comes on. 
At 11 o'clock, Roland Martin will be appearing on the stage. Now, he's worth representing Abu Garcia. Right. Which was not affiliated with Penn then. <laughs> and the Penn guy takes off to go find out what the heck's going on. <laughs> and the management says, well, we had a meeting, and nobody knows who Bouncer Smith is. So we replaced him with Roland Martin, and Penn says, well, our contract says at 11 o'clock in the morning, we have the stage. And they said, well, we're really sorry, but we don't know who this bouncer is. He says, well, he's well known in South Florida. And uh, he has some speaking experience. And they said, well, well, how about a compromise? So the next time it comes on, it's at 11 o'clock on the stage, will be world famous Florida fisherman Roland Martin and Bouncer Smith. So now we go over to the stage at quarter to 11. And you know Roland. I, I know him. I've never met him. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Right. So we go over, me and the pen guy go over to the green room at quarter to 11. And Roland's not there. And 10 minutes to 11, and Roland's not there. And 5 minutes to 11, Roland's not there. And 2 minutes to 11, Roland walks up and he says, what are we doing? And I, off the cuff, hadn't even given any thought yet. I said, well, as I understand it, you take your own boat to the west coast of Florida in the wintertime. I'm a charter boat captain on the east coast of Florida. We're going to talk about different aspects of fishing in Florida from the point of view of the charter boat on the east coast and the private boater on the west coast. We're just going to bounce things back and forth. You would have thought that we were Laurel and Harvey, Hardy or Penn and <laughs> Seller or somebody. Because we put on a show. I can imagine. That was absolutely fantastic. One of my proudest moments was the impromptu. Two guys didn't know each other, and it was just unbelievable. You know, I hold him in highest regards um, for what he did for Bass Fishing, for what he does for Bass Fishing, for him as a person. Um, you know, it's just like Jason Burton ran into, of course, you, uh, you weren't at ICAST this year. You missed ICAST, didn't you? I was there. there. Okay. Yeah. Well, Jason ran into Roland, met him, introduced himself, and immediately Roland starts talking about places on Santee that he has caught a nine pounder, a ten pounder, and and just calling it out and telling Jason like, all right, you got to go over here at this time of the year, and blah blah blah. And Jason's like, I've never met the guy from Adam's House Cat, and he's sitting here telling me where to go. Well, that's you know what's funny about that is if Roland was in his booth, our booth was next to Roland's. Oh, okay. Right next to it. Wow. So you saw Jason anyway. He said he's, uh, I'm sure y'all saw each other. At well, Ike you never know you? because I didn't spend much time in the booth. <laughs> You're always roaming around. I work for, I go to the, I go to the show to you help You work out. the floor, don't you? I go to the show to help out Hydroglow Fish Lights. And I do, I work the floor and I'm telling everybody, well, stop by and see me over at the Hydroglow Fish, fish Lights over, over in this booth here. Well, tell me about the Hydroglow while we got a second, I want you to tell me about them. What, why do I need a hydroglow, or do I need one here? Oh, yeah, you definitely need one. Okay. For? Because hydroglow fish lights was one of the first underwater lighting companies. Okay. And, and one of the best underwater light companies still today. Yep. And they offer everything from behind your house, sink a light on the bottom, and watch the fish swim over it, and it's on a on a light sensor, or on a time setter, to where it comes on every night. And and I'll give you an example. He lives on Lake Sinclair, over in Georgia. And every bass fisherman on the lake, and it's a big lake. Every bass fisherman on the lake, the sun's already come up, but they all go to Daryl's dock. Because the bass hang out under the dock during the day and around the light at night. Waiting on the light. So, so the bass fishermen know that it's lit at night. They go there in the morning to catch the bass that left the light and went back to the dock. But uh, so, Daryl Keith, Keith is one of the finest gentlemen you'll ever meet. And I'll, I'll tell you how I met him was my sister and brother-in-law went to a CCA auction. 
and they bought a hydroglow fish light. And my brother-in-law was using it to catch goggle eyes for bait. And then we started fighting over his light to go sword fishing at night. This was back when it was all nighttime in the late 1990s. And he had a light and I would borrow it and he'd have to chase me down to get it back and back and forth. And we were using this light all the time. And uh, I finally bought my own light. And the first night I went fishing, we hooked a 250 pound swordfish and I had tied the light up in the wrong place. And when I was fighting the swordfish, maneuvering the boat, I chopped the light Cut off. The light off. <laughs> so I called up Daryl and I said, Daryl, I bought a light from you, from you not too long ago. And I was wondering if you had a stupidity warranty. He says, what's a stupidity warranty? I says, well, if a guy only uses a light once, and he chops it off with his propeller. Can he get one for wholesale? And he says, well, I never heard of a stupidity warranty, but I'll send you another light. And that he sent me another light. Well, then a couple of months later, I'm using the light. And I got a guy that's crazy enough to think he can catch a swordfish on fly. And the first half an hour, he had a solid hookup, or a thought of a solid, really put a show on, but he pulled the hook. And an hour later, he hooked up again, and the fish is screaming off line on his fly reel, and I run to the helm to start chasing it. He says, wait a minute, it stopped. So this guy, Marty Arostegui from Coral Gables, Florida, ties his own fly, rigs his own rod, blind cast dredging, for two hours, or hour and a half, or I guess hour and a half, from a dead boat, catches a 40 inch, 46 inch fork length broadbill swordfish on fly. Ties his own fly, ties his own rig, does his own fishing, and from a dead boat, catches the second Western Atlantic swordfish on fly ever. ever. And the first one was caught by accident and only weighed six pounds. Wow. So with that light, you're you're you're. I, I'm, so, did he he called it over the light? Yes. Okay. So you're attracting bait up, and that's bringing the fish up. Correct. Help me out. Well, not only does it attract the bait, but it attracts the predators. Here they are out twenty miles from shore in the dark ocean. Right. If you're out in the middle of a desert at night. And you saw a light in the distance, what would you do? I'm going to go check it out. Go see well, what in the heck it is. Well, fish are the same way. Yep. What's that light over there? Oh, look, it's surrounded with squids and flying fish and, and baby blue runners and baby dolphins and, and God knows what else. And hey, this is a pretty nice place to hang out for a while. Oh, look, here's a nice, here's a nice squid hanging by another light. Yep. I mean, Lights and fishing is an important thing. It is. Now, I got to tell you, back then, a hydroglow fish light was a 24-inch or 30-inch uh, fluorescent light in a green plastic sleeve inside of a glass tube, tube. and sealed. Right. And the first ones floated horizontally, and then they made them so that there was a weight in the bottom of the PVC so they suspended vertically, but they would go as deep as you let out cord. And and now they're about as big as a big coffee mug. Yep. And much more powerful. LED's incredible. Oh yeah, you know it. Yeah. LED's and and he, and he but he makes them to throw in your lake and sit on the bottom shining up so you can see every fish that swims over. I mean he makes them to fasten to the bottom of your dock so you can look have light coming down from above. He has them to go across the bow of your boat for gigging flounders. He's got them to go across your tee top so you can see the rig stuff. And they come in all different colors and uh, sizes and shapes. And and uh, I'm going to put a link in the uh, in, in this show for you for for him because uh, I, I've I've always been intrigued by it. You know, you you and I did a show. Well, you and I did a radio interview down at Jay Bash's one time. Yep. 
and I think Jay and Kelly had one, and we brought it out, and you it, it, and you recognized that it yeah. was a hydro yep. glove. Yep. And they said they were having a lot of luck with it at three mile. That's when they were going black drum fishing at night when nobody was going fishing. Of course, I think they were doing other stuff while they were out there, but. It was a great excuse for them to go to three mile, but they were catching some of the biggest black drum. And you know, you think about it, 32 foot of water, you put that light out and that that light's gonna travel through that water and light it up. But they were ki ki killing the black drum out there. Well, Daryl Keith went crazy. He went, he his market was Lake Lanier and all the lakes in Tennessee and Altoona and all these different places. For crappie, yep. rainbow trout, and landlocked striped bass. Those were his three biggest markets. And all of a sudden, he couldn't build them fast enough to ship to Miami for nighttime sword fishing. And what was really, really funny, a commercial jet would be flying into Miami at night, and there'd be a hundred green lights. 100 miles offshore. Yep. And the people would want to know if there were Martians. <laughs> oh, oh my God. I, I, I can imagine that's got to be crazy with all those boats out there because, again, as big an innovator as you've been, as much as Nick's done for daytime sword fishing, there's still people that nighttime sword fish, correct? I went nighttime sword fishing last summer. You did? We had a guy that wanted to catch one IGFA legal, and he was in his mid 60s. And, uh, I said, there's two ways you can do it. We can go in the daytime. The fish tend to be very big. And they're 1,800 feet down. And frequently, when you get a bite, you got 3,000 feet of line out. Yeah. That's almost, that's a half a mile. <laughs> that's a half a mile you got out. Yep. And even if the fish brings the weight to the surface, you still have to wind in. 3,000 feet of line. That's like filling a reel. Yep. The only difference is you got more adrenaline because you hope there's a fish on that. Right. But at any rate, or you can go at night, and the fish will be between 103 or 400 feet down. And instead of a 12-pound lead, the biggest lead you'd have is a 2-pound lead. And I think you're better off to go at night. So he booked us for two nights. So the first night, he was from Texas. Had the best smoked turkey you could ever ask for. but uh, They can do some barbecue and smoking out there. They're unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. But at any rate, we uh, went the first night, and we a, I uh, made a deal with Freddie David, great fisherman. And uh, he has a charter boat, and he also goes on other people's boats a lot. But, but uh, I made a deal with Freddie. We'd go on Freddie's boat. And uh, it was about 2.15 or so. He comes to me and he says, I think we should wrap it up. We hadn't had a bite all night. I says, well, tell the customer you want to wrap it up. So he goes to the customer and, and the customer says, well, my luckiest time on daytime trips is 2.30. So can we give it till 2.30, see if it works at night too? So 2.30, a reel takes off. And the customer goes and grabs the rod, and he catches a night shark. It's a species of shark, pointed nose, uh, beady eyes. It tends to be caught down on the bottom in 600 feet of water. But it's pretty common at night sword fishing as well. But at any rate, we catch the night shark. So we wrap it up. But it bit right at 2.30. So the second night, about 10 o'clock, we catch a blackfin tuna. And now we're just sitting there. You know, it's really nice. It's flat, calm, loads of stars in the sky, shooting stars, and just really a fantastic night. And we're all just laying or lazing around. And I look at my watch. I says, you guys better watch out. It's 225. Well, we're all up in the bow, three of us. And Freddie David's back in the stern. And Freddie hollers, we got a fish on. And everybody goes scrambling toward the back. What's going on? He says, oh, I can see the light run around on the surface out there because we use a, a LP light right. uh, 30 feet from the bait, and we use a diamond light 
uh, five feet from the bait, and we've got the hydrogo hanging over the side. So you got the, uh, here's the city, that's the hydrogo light is. The, the uh, LP light, which is about the size of an Easter egg, says this is the restaurant. Right. And then over here you got a diamond light, which is only about as big as your thumb. That's the buffet. And that, no, that's the dinner, that's your table. Okay. So you got this chain of lights, if you think in it, it's the city, it's the restaurant, and it's the table. So yep. at any rate, you see the light run around on top, you know it's going to be a swordfish. So he runs back there, and he winds up all the slack because it was a bait that was down 300 feet. And he catches a nice 100-pound swordfish. Uh, no, no, nothing, no strain, no pain. Nice little fight, not all that line. Beautiful, calm night. Uh, middle of the summer, and it's comfortable temperature. And 2.30. And it's 2.30, yes. you got to remember it's 2.30. Marty Roski, I mentioned him earlier, caught the swordfish on fly. When, I, when we took his wife fishing, she would say, why do we even go fishing at 7.30 in the morning? She says, I never catch anything until 3 in the afternoon. Why don't we go at 2.30? Yep. <laughs> we never, she never did talk us into changing our hours. But no, heck no, that ruins it. Uh, it's, for me... Um, um, you know, I, I, I want to pick your brain about so many different things uh, c uh, pertaining to the King Michael tournament I'm in this weekend and just some different well, things. But I know. Day, wait, 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 what day is this Kingfish tournament? Um, we're, it's tomorrow, Sunday, and Monday. Your choice of one day, okay? Okay, so it's one out of three. One out of three. Okay, so let me tell you exactly what to have plan on. Okay. If you were fishing today. Right. The moon rise was at 6.02 a.m. Yep. So that would be the best time to be fishing, but it might not be in tournament hours. Right, 7 a.m. lines in. Well, the good news is, is that tomorrow morning, the very best time of the whole 24-hour period, the very best time to expect a bite is 7.09 a.m. So you better be ready. Good baits in the water. When they say lines in the water, because that'll be right at moonrise, which is the most predictable time to get a bite. What happens at moonrise, it's basically a salooner minor. And a minor is a short period of time, but it's very intense. Right. And then in the middle of the day, it'll be a major, which is not as intense, but lasts much longer. Right. So I just live by the moonrise, and if I can't get a moonrise, I'll take a moonset. And then, uh, I think I skipped a day. You did? On the 15th, yep. That's, the moonrise uh, is at 8 o'clock. Right. So, 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 so I, I just got a text from my team as we're sitting here, and the brains behind my team which we all work together. We do. We all work together and oh, contribute. Yeah. yeah. But uh, he has been working Intel really hard, and there is a very good bite that has been happening about 80 miles north of here that's just in bounds, and our decision has pretty much been made that we are going to trailer the boat up there and fish there on Sunday. So you've just made us feel a lot better because we are going to have to – we're out of here. We've already got bait pinned up. Like, I've been working – we, we've joked about it. We burnt 132 gallons of gas between two boats this week catching bait and pre-fishing and other stuff, getting ready for this weekend. But we already have bait pinned up here. But, unfortunately, we make this road trip, we don't have bait. We, don't, we make this road trip, we don't have bait. We start off. Why don't you have bait? Well, we can't get the bait up there. We don't have the tank systems. Why to, don't you? We just don't have a uh, tank system aerator that will keep those uh, certain baits alive. We Why need, don't you? I don't know why we don't. I mean, all you're talking about is a chemtainer. Right, a chemical t container with and, a big and, aerator. And a bottle of bait stabilizer and slime creator. Okay. And a 12-volt plugs into your cigarette lighter, big aerator. Yep. That's all it takes to move those baits up there. So in South Florida, let me tell you a story. Y'all are big about tra transferring bait and traveling baits Let me baits tell you about there. Jimmy Lewis. Yep. I'm fishing name. with Chris and some of his buddies in Isla Mirada, Florida. Yep. 
and it's blowing 35. But we're going to fish for three days. We've got a container in the water that we borrowed from a guy in Miami. Or no, borrowed from a guy in Key Largo. We've got a container with a bunch of holes in it in the water. We've got a bucket of crabs in a bait bucket hanging in the water. And 5 o'clock in the morning, blowing 35, Jimmy Lewis arrives from Miami in his pickup truck with, I guess it was six, seven, maybe it was eight dozen goggle eyes. 72 goggle eyes, whatever that is. Math's not working this far. So 10. Six. Six, seven six, dozen. Seven dozen. So seven times. No, that'd be six. Six, okay. Well, anyway. 72 is six. Okay, 72. Six dozen. Goggle eyes. Because if it was seven, it would have to be four, four on the end. Yeah, okay. I'm teaching math to my six-year-old. That's how okay, I there you go. <laughs> Keep going. So anyway, right, he brings 72 goggle eyes down in his truck in a big container with big aerators, and, and he transports goggle eyes from Miami to Tennessee to an aquarium. And he delivers live bait to kingfish tournaments. Yes, he does. He comes all up All over the place. Yep. So at any rate, he puts 72 goggle It's blowing 35. He puts 72 goggle eyes in our container that he caught during the night on this night. So he's been out in this 35-mile-an-hour wind, caught us 72 goggle eyes, and delivered them at 5.30 in the morning. And he's having a cup of coffee with us. And 10 minutes later, all the goggle eyes are dead. Ooh. And we pull up, pull up the crab bucket just on a whim, and all our crabs are dead. The canal we're staying in, which is a dead-end canal, which has construction down the block, Hmm. Our canal is toxic. Yep. And it kills everything in the water. Wow. From from uh, wow. driving pilings and and construction work. I'm not gonna there. I'm not gonna get into it because I know Florida is dealing with a lot of stuff down there. Yeah. You, uh, Captains for Clean Water, a great oh, yeah. group, a great group of people. Fantastic group. Um, and, and what y'all deal with. But what I am gonna say is this much: a uh, dozen goggle eyes are not cheap. No. <laughs> but but listen to this. So we tell Jimmy, well, we'd like to get some more goggle eyes delivered tomorrow, but deliver them to Bud and Mary's. We'll move the boat up to Bud and Mary's. We'll move the bait container up to Bud and Mary's, and we'll put them in the bait container at Bud and Mary's. We've already got approval to do that. Right. And 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 we're going to buy another seventy-two goggle eyes, which. Is about seventy dollars a dozen, right? Jimmy Lewis shows up at three thirty in the morning. Went out and caught the goggle eyes, still blowing thirty to thirty-five knots, and he won't take a dime. Wow. He says, "I I guarantee my baits will live," and those baits died. So I can't charge you for these. Well, we convinced him that. It wasn't his fault. No, it wasn't his fault. But that's how honorable Jimmy is. And we insisted that we... Uh, you got Jimmy's number? Oh, yeah. We heavily tip him. Will you share that with me? Yeah. Okay, good. Because I'm going to find out if he's coming up this weekend. This is a big tournament. So I'm, I just didn't know if he might be coming up. And he probably isn't because it's in North Carolina. I don't think he... I know he'll make the trip to Charleston a lot. He comes to most big tournaments in Charleston. He'll come up. But um, yeah, Jimmy's phone number. Yep. Really we'll great. Give it out. Give Why it out. not? Yeah, let's give it out. Go ahead. Yeah, Absolutely. Jimmy Lewis, who lives in Miami and yep. delivers bait all over the East Coast. Yep. Is three zero five. Okay. Seven two five. Okay. Eight eight zero seven. All right. Again, that's Jimmy Lewis live bait. Yep. Three zero five seven two five eight eight zero seven. And a little history about Jimmy. Jimmy's father started collapsible fishing kites, Captain Bob Lewis. And now Jimmy has his own kites. 
But uh, they've been in the kite business since the early 50s. And uh, Jimmy, Jimmy's one of these guys that they used to say that I would, I would fish. I'd, I'd be at the dock you? before 7 in the morning, and I would fish an eight-hour day trip, take an hour to clean my catch and get my head squared away, and then I'd do a four-hour tarpon trip at night. So I would, leave the, I would get to the dock before 7 in the morning, leave the dock after 10 o'clock at night. So my sister always joked, people said, how in the world does he do that? She said, oh, we hang him in the closet and plug him into a battery charger. Yep. So, so Jimmy Lewis is worse than me. You're a machine, though. You are. I, I mean, you know, I, I've told you I had that instant last night where a younger captain and his wife made the comment, so who is this guy? And it was kind of like, you know, kind of like, well, who is this guy? Like, he can't be all that. And uh, it was funny because a couple of the younger captains here and a couple of your other friends here were kind of like all stepped up. And I, I, I reached over and I said, this man is a legend. He is a living legend. I said, if you haven't read anything from him, if you've not heard him talk, if you've not watched him on TV, if you've not heard anything about him, you're obviously, honestly, not a fisherman. And, and I say that in a sense, and I'm not, I, I mean, listen, I'm a huge fan of yours. You know that. I mean, I, I. I completely appreciate our friendship um, and the fact that you'll respond to my text messages when I send them to you, at least within 48 hours. Um, and I have nothing but the highest respect. And I started, when I first learned about you, I was first getting into charter fishing. I first got into fishing and charter fishing at the same time. I know that makes no sense, but I needed something to get me away from alcohol. And I got into fishing and then I said, you know, the only way I'm going to do this is if I can make some money doing it. And I, I spent countless hours on the water trying to i really just wanted to learn inshore here that's it i didn't care about offshore you know i knew yeah. i knew for me to offer a value to a customer i needed to know what i was doing yep. you know unfortunately there's too many people here that don't and they charge people for trips that they shouldn't they shouldn't have their captain's license no, but, but they know what an osprey is and a porpoise and exactly but they can talk about and a pine beauty, tree and, and they know what creek that is and what grass that is and everything and you else. see that house right there Yep. When they talk about that house on Monday, it belonged to uh, Otis Redding yep. back then, back in the day, and now it belongs to uh, Dolly Billy Parton. Joel. How many times have you heard Dolly Parton on the house at the point? Well, I the, know worst you've part got the worst part about it is Dolly Parton owns it this week, and uh, and uh, what's my girlfriend's name is really famous right now. Oh. Uh, Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. <laughs> That's my house now. It. Yeah. Yep. You're right. You're right. You know, she's finally doing something I could never understand. I bought tickets for for my mate and and his date to go see Billy Joel in Miami one time. Oh wow. I would love to go to that. And and I was trying to figure out, okay, they went and saw the concert. Why can't I go on pay per view or 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 a movie theater or something and watch it and watch that concert in a couple of months. Yep. And Dolly Parton is I mean not Taylor Swift is finally doing that. She they videotaped her concert and now it's a first and Now it's a movie. movie. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and you uh, know she made her own deal with AMC. Yep. It wasn't it wasn't uh, uh, an agency or an something agency. came to her. She went to them and said, let's make a movie. You know, my kids love her, my daughter especially. I've been in love with her since she first came out. Me too. You know what I liked about her? She was very pretty, but she was very wholesome. Wholesome. She's real. Yeah. Like, you know, they're giving her so much hell about Kelsey right now. about, And they're giving Kelsey hell about her, blah, 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 whatever, and, and, and whatever. But, like, when he scored or when he got that 142nd yard in the game Sunday – um, to watch her jump up hugging Patrick Mahone's wife in excitement, she's just a genuine person. She just really yeah. is. And, and then to see that she, you know, after that but, last tour that was so big, and to see her just hand out bonuses to all her drivers, to everybody. Yeah. I mean, so many of these other celebrities in that light, they, they, they're, they're worried more about their account. Well, well uh, she is the exact opposite of some of the best-known Act uh, performers of the day. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of them are the worst people that you'd ever want to meet. But, but one of the, one of the things about her situation, 
is that she has to have people around her of the same caliber for them to understand the limitations of life. A girl like Taylor right. Swift cannot go to um, she can't uh, Walmart. To she can't go to Walmart nope. and and look at dresses. Yep. Because she would never get to see a dress. She would be mobbed. A person like that, you know, the, you say she, oh, she's making so much. But she has to pay w the department store or the high-end store, whatever it is, wherever she, even a restaurant. Yep. They have to have a private room or they have to pay that restaurant to open on Monday night so that she can go out to dinner. Well, did you notice that but, no tables around us got sat? I had well, to pay you know here why, for Bouncer. It, I had to pay because Bouncer was no, coming. I, I, the truth of the matter was that I didn't want to embarrass you, but it was the fact you haven't taken a shower yet. This well, no, I have. I took it's a shower this it's morning. It's already the 13th, you know. But I told him, I said, listen, Tomorrow we, we night need a private Saturday area. Night, you know. It is. You can take a bath. I know. I, I, will, I will probably be sleeping in a truck somewhere in North Carolina, <laughs> so I'm not worried about it. They'll get over oh, it. So you'll, oh, so you'll be really stinky. Yep, I'm going to be night. really stinky. But if I, I can. I, I have to say I wasn't stinky last night because I took a shower all day. They, uh, yeah, you <laughs> did. It was a cold shower. I still can't night. get over the fact that y'all fished yesterday. But I'll tell you what. Well, one, we you love are, fishing. That's the other thing. We both agreed. It was me and Buddy Smith. And we have both agreed that you couldn't pay us to work in that. But we were out nope. there fun fishing. It was really crazy. And, we and, but that, uh, you know, that's why you're such a leader and, and you're such a, uh, um, I mean, an idol for all these young guys, for, for uh, older guys like me. But uh, you love this sport. You love this sport. And where I was getting at earlier, and by the way, I'm not going to tell everybody that we talked about Taylor Swift on our podcast. They're going to find not? out anyway. But, um. The, the, you mean so much to this sport. You have meant so much for so many years um, to this sport. And I, I just want one question that I wanted to ask you is, what do you want to be your legacy in this sport? Sharing, in one word. I have alienated plenty of good men over the last 54 years because... I wouldn't take what you showed me how to do so much as I would take what I figured out on my own, and I would share it with everybody. Right. I wouldn't give you my GPS numbers. I'm no, sorry. You're out of No. I, 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 I might, don't think anybody I might, should. I might give you the GPS numbers to— I don't a, think anybody should do that. I would give my numbers to a well, of a well-known spot to people, like the numbers at the end of the jetty. But I certainly wouldn't give out the GPS numbers to my favorite wreck. No, I don't, I, I don't but, think anybody should, but, and I'm but, always against that. But sharing is so important. And the best people to share with. Hang on one second. How does this work? So. Oh, redeem now. We got money. Hey, I'm checking out here. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to well, guess. Well, we have the most beautiful. I, we do the have the most beautiful waiters. I am not lying. In we have been lucky, and, and, and we are live right now. So, um, yes, we have had an incredible. Turn your head again. We have had an incredible breakfast oh, look this at morning. That pink highlights. And I am, well, I'll tell you I am right sending now. this lovely lady on her way. I'm going to need a receipt. Can you print it for me? Okay, just do print. All right, and I'll remove my car. There you go. Boy, it's crazy where we're at these days. Yeah, but you know what? It is. This is the second time I've been on a major vacation, and I got notified this morning that my credit card was hacked. No way. My favorite credit card. I can't use the rest of my trip. We started talking about it earlier. I came to Merle's Inlet, Merle's Inlet Fishing Center. I went fishing with Jimmy Deaver and Chris Regan. I went with Tommy, Tommy Warner. Warner. And I got to meet Caleb. I don't remember Caleb's last Caleb name. Caleb Hartley. And then, of course, I spent time with Chris Conklin and his family. And this guy, Inglis, I don't know where we found him at. I don't know. But at any rate, and then I went to uh, uh, Beaufort, North Carolina. And I went fishing there a couple of days and had lunch with Jake Jordan, 
my idol. He's a 81 year old fishing guide that teaches fly fishing all over the world. Wow. For blue marlin and sailfish and tarpon and goes to Alaska and goes salmon fishing. He's 81? Still running his charters. And there you are, retired at 65. I mean, well, good God. Well, yeah, but I retired as a sacrifice to other people, giving credit to myself. <laughs> but, but, but no, but seriously, my, my sister and I shared a condo on Miami Beach, and she had two grandchildren in Marietta, Georgia, that really needed a grandparent in their life. That's right. And I kept telling her, go, go, go. And she finally says, I ain't going until you retire and go with me. So, huh? And then my mate had been with me for 13 years, and he says, you know, Bouncer, I love you like you were my second dad, but i got to make a name for myself at some point. I'm going out on my own. So between the two of them, I says, okay, I'll retire and go to Marietta, Georgia. So is he so, still running the Dusky? Well, not the Dusky, but he has a very successful charter business. He actually runs two boats. His name is A.B. Raymond, and he's down on Miami Beach, or actually Hall A.B., A.B., correct? A.B., yeah. yeah. And... He's got a 27-foot Seahawk. It's somewhere. It's built somewhere here in the Carolinas. Yeah, Seahawk. But he has a 27-foot Seahawk with a tower, and he has a flats boat, so he can take you mahi mahi fishing, right, or tarpon fishing, and snook fishing, or he can take you out in the Everglades for peacock bass and largemouth bass and all the exotics, the clown knife fish and all that stuff. So he's got the full gamut. And, that is awesome. Uh, got the personality. He is the perfect charter boat captain. He's an extremely good fisherman. But when you walk up to him five years later, he'll ask you how your son and daughter is by name and ask you how your mounted uh, kingfish looks and everything else, every detail. So are you... Great, great point. Are you with Grace Taxidermy? Who are you with? Uh, I always supported Grace Taxidermy after Fleur closed down. Okay. That's what I thought. I have, yep. a, I have a good friend. I've had good friends that worked there over the years. I'll tell you, Captain Chris, and you have taught him well. You have taught Captain Chris well. Apparently, he sells a lot of mounts. Chris Reagan? Or, yep, Chris yeah, Chris Reagan. I'll yep. tell you a funny story about that. I was sitting on the dock, I think it was last year. Pretty sure it might have been the year before. Yep. But at any rate, I'm sitting on the dock waiting for the boats to come in in the afternoon. And here they all come, and they've been in the kingfish really, really good. And two boats hooked sailfish at the same time. And both boats caught the sailfish on their kingfish outfits, which are about what we use in Florida, but we for use sailfish. different hooks. Yeah. But at any rate, they both caught, each both, caught a, both boats caught a sailfish. So the first boat that caught a sailfish comes in, and they're hooping and hollering and showing off the pictures and... And uh, everybody's hanging around, and I asked the guy, I said, so you get getting mounted? He says, gee, I don't know. How do you do that? And I started talking to him, and I had everything in my truck to give him a brochure. Right. Not a, not, I couldn't write it up, but I could give him a brochure. brochure. And I could actually sell them out over the phone to, right. to uh, Greg Taxidermy. I had their phone number and everything. But anyway, Chris Reagan's there, and Chris Reagan says, oh, I got all the forms and everything on the boat. So he goes and gets the forms, and he mounts. He writes up a mount for a release mount. You know, today, as you well know, we don't have to kill any fish. No, that's the great thing. We can measure it or even estimate the length. And if you get a picture, that's great. If you redfish, you really need a picture so they know exactly where to put the black dots. Right. But at any rate, and they make a what we call a release mount, which is a perfect 3D reproduction of your fish. But they're here expressing you have your cake, you need it too. Now you can have the mount and the redfish for dinner, or you can have the mount and tag the redfish and know that you can go back next year and have a chance to catch the same redfish. Yep. Which, by the way, uh, Jimmy Deaver caught a redfish on Saturday that had two tumors on it. And I caught the same redfish on Tuesday and you look at the two pictures, you see the tumors and everything. And no doubt about it, it's the same fish in the same spot. From up north? Yeah. Wow. But, but when you release things, you get to catch them over and over again. Thank you. When, when you kill them, the story ends right there. All but right. that doesn't mean we can't keep a fish for dinner. No. That just means that you should not justify 
that you can use this one for fertilizer, give this one to my mechanic, give this one to that woman down the street, give this one to, I'll find somebody to give it the to. The landowner that lets me deer hunt. And then, and then I'll fill my freezer with nicely packaged fish, and I'll put it in the very bottom, and in three years I'll discover they're still there when my freezer goes out and everything in there stinks to high heavens. I remember that great trip that I killed all those fish and spent three days bagging it up and letting it rot in the bottom of my freezer. Yep. So the bottom line is when you go fishing, don't catch your limit. Limit your catch. Limit your catch. Okay. Amen. And I'll tell you, that's a good spot to end on with you. And I know we're going to have more podcasts and, in the future. And we just got started. I know. We ain't even t- I didn't even finish my monthly trip. I'm not uh, done yet. Okay, was, you keep going. Come on, come on. Then I, I got to go back to I'm what? Going from here to Jacksonville, Jacksonville to New Smyrna Beach, New Smyrna Beach to Merritt Island, Merritt Island to Melbourne, Melbourne to Boynton Beach, Boynton Beach to Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale to Miami, and then back to Marietta, Georgia. I plan on being in Marietta, Georgia on the 2nd of November. But but uh, the, all that between now and the second of November. Yes. Good luck. I started um, on May on so, uh, October first. So, so here's our other deal. So when I go to Florida, it, I'm going. I'll be in Okeechobee sometime between November and March. Okay. When I go to Okeechobee, I'm reaching out to you the week before I go down there, and I want you to get me your connection with your peacock guy. That is my bucket list fish for fresh water and I'm going to get that number from you before I go down there I'm going to call this guy because I made a mistake the last time went down and and then called when I was there to and I'm guessing it's the same guy because I got the number from Chris Regan and from Jason Burton but it might be the same guy but and the guy was booked so I want to book it before I go down there but I am going all all I want to do is catch one that's that's the number I've got hold it right there I'll take a picture all right let's uh, build a pre build a pre one five six one. Go ahead and give that hold number on, out. Hold on. Yeah, let's wait, give him. Wait, wait. We have modern technology. Watch here. Watch this. Watch this. Stop a minute. Oh, are you gonna wait a minute? You're you're really getting ready. You're getting Look ready at to this. step. Look at this. You're getting ready to step my game up. Pow! I just sent it to you. It's on your messages. Bam! I got it. Isn't that modern technology? That is. Oh, we're going to teach you how to make a phone call next week. That is awesome. That is awesome. Look, I've got it. It's saved already. Um, wow. Earlier, I was trying to get at something, how I was introduced to you and, and found out uh, about you. And it was uh, captain came in. I was uh, I, I, once again, I was still here bartending. I wasn't managing anymore at Dead Dog. I was behind the bar working and a captain comes in. Guy had uh, and this is where I got introduced to raccoon eyes, had raccoon eyes. And I could tell he wasn't from here, and we got to talking, and we really hit it off good. I got off work. We had a couple of drinks. He went and introduced me to his girlfriend at that time and uh, brought my wife over. My new wife, we had just gotten married, and we hung out for a little bit. We got to talking, and then he w- showed me his boat, and I went, what is a dusky? I'd never heard of a dusky. And so we started looking it up, and he was telling me, he's like, oh, you've got to have heard of Bouncer, blah, blah, blah. This is, about, you know, Bouncer. At that time, I think you had, they only made like a 27 or 28 or right, 20, something along those 25 lines. 25 and a half. And his was a 25 and a half. It's identical to yours. And I don't even know that it might not have been one of your past boats. I can't remember the whole story on it, but his name is Captain Scotty Feltman. And uh, now he runs out of Well, well Harbor, uh, runs his own. He's got a sport fisher now, runs out of there. Hound Dog Charters is the name of it. Um, but he got to talking about you. So we started looking up, blah, blah, blah. Well, oddly enough, then the next year, I went to one of George's uh, seminars here. You weren't a speaker here, but I found out that you were a speaker at a couple other places, at a couple other seminars. And then I started, I can't remember where it was. I started reading uh, somebody had done, maybe George had done it, or they had done a special on you in, what was George's, Saltwater What's his magazine? Uh, Saltwater Sportsman. Saltwater Sportsman. They had done an article, and, and they had uh, the story. They did an interview with you and the story about playing um, poker or something with the fishing. Oh, yeah, with, uh, with, 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 uh, with the, uh, um, Jimmy Hoffa. With Jimmy Hoffa. They were playing poker. Yeah. Bottom fishing. With a, with a, 
a chicken rig. Yep, a chicken rig with five hooks, right? He got on my boat. I had two hooks on each one. He says, you got to put five hooks on each one. Oh, no, we don't need that. We catch plenty of fish for two hooks. He says, no, we need five hooks on every rod. So I says, okay, on the way out, the mate will re-rig all the rods. So we did. We got out there, and we dropped down on some vermilion snappers, and they're all hollering and hooping, and Hoffa says, okay, wind them all up. They wind them up, and this guy's got a pair. And the next guy's got three of a kind. And then he's got a guy with two pair. And they played poker with their chicken rigs all, all day. day. And the crazy part is we use sabiki rigs all the time, and we never play poker. Right. You could do the same thing with a sabiki, sabiki rig, rig. catching bait. That is a good idea. Did well, they pay off? Well, they were, play, they were playing in a coffee can. Remember when coffee came in cans? Oh, yeah. Well, back then, that's what we used instead of plastic buckets for sinkers and stuff like that. Used coffee cans. Yeah, they so, were tin cans that were about uh, about a quart size, and they put one in the middle of the deck, and they threw their quarters and silver dollars and 50-cent pieces in the coffee can. Wow. You you have seen so much, and, and I tell you, the, the sport of fishing is better because of you. You you you're Limit your catch. Uh, uh, don't catch your limit. Limit your catch. That is a saying that I'm going to start using a lot more because it is so true. There are so many people that worry more about what they can kill than what, than the catch, than the experience, than, than I mean, just so much more. I mean, I find myself, I find myself just like our trip to the lake last week. I didn't care about killing 50 crappie or 40 crappie. I just wanted to kill enough to make a good dinner. And I was fine with releasing the rest, but it got frustrating when I couldn't catch what I wanted. Uh, you know, I, I, I think I caught five fish total that we caught, but it got frustrating. But there's so many people I know that would have been sitting right there where I was and would have every fish they caught that was over eight inches that would have been in their cooler. Yeah. And like you said, it would have gone in the freezer, fallen to the bottom and wasted at some point. Sure. It happens every day. But... Everybody's getting better about it. And you want to know the truth of the matter? The Weekend Warrior is the first one to recognize that the future requires using circle hooks. Yep. And the Weekend Warrior is the first one to recognize you got to keep your fish wet. They can't breathe while you're taking pictures. You can't take the same picture with five cameras. Today, you take the picture with one camera and send it to all the other cameras. And, and when you take a billfish out of the water and hold it up for a picture, you might as well kill it because the federal government's already told you it's against the law to do that. And the scientists have proven that that fish is probably going to die tomorrow. So you might as well kill it today if you're going to take it out of the water for a picture. Well, I'll tell you, you... you you inspired me and so you've inspired me in so many different ways but i want to show you this tarpon picture and the videos i'm going to get up and you'll I'm you know thrilled a lot of people will that. listen to this a lot of people will end up listening to this video and they're probably going to say like those two like why are they so worried about this fish there's a there's a reason we're worried about this fish let me explain to you first and foremost why we're worried about this fish we're both purists lucas my fishing partner and i are both very big purists we, we, we love what God has offered us, the opportunity to go catch, and we want it to have the best chance to survive. Now, yes, do we kill a king mackerel in a tournament? Yes, we do. Do we kill Spanish mackerel in a tournament? Yes. Do I That's kill? That's okay because I, you may think I'm nuts, but I absolutely love to eat king mackerel. I love to eat Spanish. I oh, love Spanish it. mackerel the same way. But that, that is us at the side of the boat, and this is the extent of what we did to it, and that was touch the tail and when once we realized where that treble was, we knew we weren't going to get it out. And this fish, in the video you'll see, after, after this point, this fish showed a real big, another kick, and like it had a lot of life, and we just tightened down and popped it off. Yep. And, and the treble, there was no hook inside of the mouth. All the hook was on the outside of that jaw, right in that little corner. And, so, and, and with a tarpon, especially where they roll, that is going to oxidize out pretty quick. But also... And people will get very concerned about it, but a lot of times you'll see some deterioration, some infection around that hook, and that infection actually pushes the hook out. I got an interesting story, you know. This same uh, with you or me. Oh, we're going to make three podcasts here while we're sitting here. No, but, but Ray Rocher was catching mahi mahi for the University of Miami Rosenstiel School to study 
propagation of, of mahi mahi in captivity. And in the course of the day, they gut hooked three dolphin. And they weren't bleeding, but they were gut hooked, so they cut the leaders and they threw them in the tank. At the end of the trip, the three hooks the, were down the throat of the mahi mahi. At the end of the trip, the three hooks were laying in the bottom of the live well. Did they come up or down? <laughs> Tell me that. Well, they, they don't came... know which way they went. But these gut hook fish rejected the hook in the course of the trip. Whether they coughed them up or passed them through their whole system, nobody knows, but I would imagine they coughed them up. But the bottom line is I've caught the same, the same barracuda seven times with a gill raker, which is like a lung injury on you. The gill raker was hanging out the back of the gill plate. Yep where at some point it had to bleed like crazy. I caught that same barracuda seven times. I caught a snook with the same injury. I caught a white marlin, and if I had the time, I'd look up the picture right now, that was cut open from here all the way across the belly to the other side, from the lateral line all the way under the belly to the lateral line, and healed over to where you could cup your fingers around the cut and go like this, or go like this, and all the guts are laying right there, all organized and straight, just like totally healed up white marlin. What do you think caused that injury? Oh, there's no telling. He could have been hit with a gaff. That's, that's what I was thinking. He could yeah. have been. He could have been in a school of sardines, and another hell, a blue marlin might have hit him there. Yep. Do you know? People don't realize it, but I've seen white marlin in the stomachs of blue marlin. I've seen swordfish in the stomachs of blue marlin. I've seen sailfish in the stomachs of white marlin. We don't think about a billfish eating a billfish. Right. But all the, I have not heard about, but seen these things. The sailfish in the white marlin was in Atlantic City, New Jersey. The swordfish in the blue marlin were in Key West. The white marlin in the blue marlin was in Chub K. And these things go on all the time. It's like, it's like we all talk about turtle hatchings and, and how critical it is that, oh, my God, a bird stole one on the beach. But they catch dolphin, and they've got 20 turtles in their stomach. Right. And, and uh, I, I did an April Fool's article with Steve Waters down in Fort Lauderdale years ago all about using seahorses for live bait for blackfin tunas. As an April Fool's April Fool's, joke. yeah. And I'll be a son of a gun. We were f cleaning a dolphin one day, and my mate's wife says, A.B., cut up on that dolphin's stomach. I want to see why it's so full. 23 seahorses in the stomach of a dolphin. They'll eat anything, though. They'll oh, eat yeah. anything. Dolphin, but... definitely. Can you imagine that out <laughs> in the middle of the ocean, there's giant balls of little puffer fish that the tunas and the marlin ball up just like they do sardines? On puffers? On puffers. I tell you what, I wouldn't want I wouldn't want a puffer biting me. I certainly wouldn't want to swallow one. No. But that's something that people have to understand. You have nerves in your mouth. Right. Yep. That you feel a fish bone or you feel your coffee's too hot. They don't. They don't have those nerves. People say, why does a fight fish fight when you pull on it? Did you ever put a leash on a two-year-old kid? Oh, yeah. I never approved of it. But and on my one-year-old dog. Well, I, well we're going to use kids as an example because okay. they're higher on the level even the dogs are. But you cannot tell a two-year-old where to go with a leash. No. Because the harder you pull, the harder they pull. There you go. Well, that's what fish are reacting to. They're responding to resistance, not to pain. Because if I take a hook and drive it into the jaw of a tarpon and I pull on him, he'll run like hell. But if, I, if he goes under a dock and I put an anchor ball on my reel and he's screaming drag and I drop that reel in the water and all of a sudden it's got no resistance, the tarpon stops and my anchor ball and my rod and reel are halfway underneath the dock. Right. <laughs> yep. I can't tell you how many times that happened to me. And now i got to go 
back and get the anchor ball, reach way under the duck, and pull on it again, and get him running hard, and throw it so it might make it out the other side. Wow, that is awesome. I'll tell you what, you talk about something fun. You ought to see when you hook a doubleheader or a sailfish on light tackle, and here's this guy brought his own high-class gold outfit, and you clip an anchor ball out, and you say, okay, throw it overboard. You want me to what? <laughs> throw, yep. my, throw my favorite $1,000 outfit in the water so you can go chase that other one? Yep. Because you got two sailfish, two one sailfish. 600 yards that way, one 600 yards. You either got to break one off, which will kill the fish, or throw the rod overboard, go catch the first one, go back and get the second one. So how do you throw the rod overboard? You put an anchor ball on it, you know, a big float. On the rod? Yeah, we clip it onto the harness lug or around the foregrip and throw it overboard. All right, is this a joke? April, th- uh, no, is this a no Friday joke. 13th joke? Really? No, it ain't no so you joke. you just jumped the rod out? Yeah. And just set the drag loose or? Just leave the drag set because you want to, you're out you of line keep the anyway. Tension. Well, you're yeah. out of line anyway. You don't want tension because then the fish would keep going. But if you throw the thing overboard, all of a sudden he's not being. He'll relax. T- he'll relax, right. Wow. And we're using circle hooks so they don't fall out. All right, since we're going to go ahead and go for two hours, why don't you tell me this much? Well, let me tell you, let me tell you about how far this can go. Okay. So we got a doubleheader sailfish on a Saturday morning, and we're out of line on both reels. So we clipped the customer's outfit, and we would do either one. It didn't make any difference to me, but we clipped the customer's outfit over on, throw it overboard, and we go catch the other fish, and I'm trying to keep track of the anchor ball, and I lose track of it, so I have to go back to where... I threw it overboard and then judge for the current, the wind, and the next time. And I decided that it should be straight west of us. So I cannot find the anchor ball, but a half mile straight west of us, there's a boat anchored up bottom fishing. So I drive over to the boat. And I'm going to ask him, have you seen an anchor ball out here somewhere? And I look in the bottom of the boat, there's, an anchor, there's my anchor ball. And then I look, and the guy's over there fishing with our rod and reel. <laughs> <laughs> I says, I hate to ruin your day, but we need our rod and reel and anchor ball back. He says, well, I found it floating. Some other boat had cut the line, drove by too close to it, and cut the sailfish off. But it's really important for us to share the fact that if you, catch a, if you hook a sailfish... And you're getting up to the boat, and you're using a tournament 15-foot leader. Please don't cut the leader at the snap swivel. Please never leave more length of line on a sailfish than the length of than the reach the middle of the fish. Yep. Because if that leader is tapping his tail, he panics and panics and panics until he dies. Blue marlin, tarpon, groupers. They'll all survive that line hanging out behind them pretty damn good. I've seen tarpon with 30 feet of moss dragging behind them. But a sailfish runs itself to death. In all of my 54 years, I've only caught one sailfish with a line longer than his body, and that was all balled up on his bill, and he had been tagged the day before. Wow. But in all the captains I talked to and everything else, I've only met one or two that ever thought that they had seen a sailfish with a line longer than his body on him. That is that is that is great because uh, I know a lot of a lot of the ones that get caught here and released, um, albeit whether you want to release it or not, are caught like you said, king mackerel fishing, like the, the charter over at MIFC had done, caught charter fishing with wire. You know, with a wire leader for kings, and, and typically they're going to cut it off right at the leader if they can't get it out. Um, hopefully most of them can get it out, but um, I would most have never thought t- about that. awful lot of times of the time, it's better to cut the leader, let the fish figure out how to get rid of the hook, instead of suffocating the fish right. or injuring it worse trying to get the hook out. The I mean, point, what, what's the hook cost you, a dollar maybe? Yeah, who cares about that? Yeah. Yeah, you shouldn't be worried about the money. If, you, if you're worried about the money of a hook, you shouldn't be fishing. We all know well, where no, that is. No, that's not true. We should be fishing in a cheaper place. Okay, you're right. Because we should never quit fishing. What's the biggest challenge to our sport, you think? Environment. In we, can, a, we, can, we can educate fishermen to keep their fish wet, limit the time the fish is out of the water, if out of the water at all. 
cut the leader close to the mouth, use circle hooks, uh, North Carolina law, don't let redfish swallow the hook, put the sinker six inches from the hook so right. they won't swallow it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if we don't have estuaries and clean water, we don't have anything whatsoever. Nope. And then you take it up the scale. The next thing is, if we don't have glass minnows and finger mullet and peanut bunker and et cetera, we're not going to have anything bigger. So it starts with the environment. Yep. What's the biggest factor on bait fish? What do you think is, uh, you know, of course, Brant McMullen, my good friend who I'm fishing, that's his tournament we're fishing in this weekend out of Ocean Isle Fishing Center. Brant has spoke at plenty of George's deals. Brant started a real big petition to shut down uh, drag netting for Manhattan off of North Carolina. Um, he made a lot of headway with it, made some cha- got some changes made, but is it draggers? Is it big drag you boats? Give me a napkin, by the way. Yeah. Is it big drag boats? You tell me. What 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 do you think is the biggest? Well, just one, just one. I just need to put okay. one in the cup. Okay. The biggest issue is water quality in estuaries. Yep. A dragger can't catch big menhaden if you don't have peanut bunker. And if we don't have a good quality environment creating good healthy plankton, we don't have peanut bunker. If we don't have peanut bunker, we don't have menhaden. If we don't have menhaden, we don't have striped bass, red drum, kingfish, sailfish, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it all goes back to the environment again. Yep. They are very important. And then, quite frankly, if our environment is declining, then our production of Manhattan is declining, and therefore our harvest of Manhattan has declined. And that's one of the things, the two things we can control sooner or later. Our, the quickest response is to control our harvest. Right. And, and, and you talk about one hand, you've got to talk the other hand. I don't want any Manhattan draggers, but I want Manhattan chum. Yep. Can't have both. I don't know. I got a chum grinder myself. I, I can throw the cast net. Well, yeah, but you're talking about cast netting a five gallon buck in a Manhattan. Right. He's talking about cast uh, dragging metric tons metric of tons. Manhattan. Yep. And, and, Dodging your 10-foot cast net to a school of Manhattan is a hell of a lot easier than dodging a dragger. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, have you looked at the bottom of a boat when they dump those nets and all the other species that are in there? Oh, I don't know about men. I don't know that much about Manhattan dragging. Right. But the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life was a shrimp boat giving bycatch to a sport fishing boat. Yep. I mean, I mean, advertising your bycatch? What do we got here? Oh, we got a baby red snap. Oh, what are we looking here? We got a trout. Oh, look, oh, look at there. We got a we got a crab and we got a flounder and we got a seahorse. Yep. Now the tuners don't have anything to eat because we killed all the seahorses. Killed all the seahorses dragging for shrimp. I and, and, but by this other hand I want to eat shrimp for dinner. And, and you say, well, go farm the shrimp. But have you ever heard the stories about the water pollution caused by a shrimp farm? No, but I can imagine it's got to be horrendous. Oh, it's, it kills the whole river below them. Yeah. I mean, right at the overflow, it's snook lined up like cordwood. Because when they have overflow, some shrimp get out. Get out. So the snook, they're eating the shrimp. So, but, but behind the snook... The water is so repulsive, nothing can live in it. Yep. That makes and, sense. And it's an interesting thing. You would never think of it in a million years. But the biggest problem is too much fertilizer. Whether it's shrimp effluence, or it's hog effluence, or it's man effluence, or if it's too much fertilizer from farming... Destroying Lake Okeechobee, and when they destroy Lake Okeechobee, it festers and it blooms and it grows and it grows and it grows. 
and then they dump it all in the ocean and yep. kill everything in the ocean. They killed so much in the lake, so then they dump it in the ocean and they kill so much in the ocean. Yep. And 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 it's a vicious problem. Florida has a big problem, and I, I know. Um, well, this is, I, I hate to get political, but here we have. I think it's two families, it might be three families, own all the sugar cane in Florida. And sugar cane is the biggest destroyer of Lake Okeechobee. And if that ain't bad enough, the sugar cane families are subsidized by the federal government. Government. So they get made, make more money for their sugar than a Cuban gets for his sugar. Right. And, and if it was a properly run world, the government would go to the sugarcane families and they would say, listen, we all like to have sugar in our coffee. We all like to have sugar on our cereal. So we're going to make, we're going to produce sugar. But if you want to be a sugar farmer, you have to develop your own marshland to filter out your your uh, nutrients. Yeah. Instead of the state of Florida and the United States government and, and Captain for Clean Water having to develop a marshland to clean out your water. Your water. It's your water. You clean it. Yep. They, yep. they don't come in and give you a free septic tank. No. And they no. don't come fix it when it's broke. I know we I know here we we preach and preach and preach but our oysters are the most important part of our environment here. They are oysters and no, what no, they do. No, I'm sorry. Your septic tank is the most important part of our environment. Okay. Then comes the oysters. our oysters. Okay. But you're because right about you the, have to pollute the water before the oysters have to clean the water. Clean the water. So it's odd. I live a mile from the inlet. Exactly. Our neighborhood. On the we, water or a no, mile? No, I, I live in a neighborhood. Our pond that we have in our neighborhood, our retention pond, drain pond, whatever you want to call it, um, has a direct route to the inlet. I learned this because I got appointed to the water commission here. But my neighborhood pond directly flows into a underground pipe stream, whatever you want to call it. it. It was natural at one point. Then it does get man-made as it gets closer. Um, and it has made me so, because I've gotten to see the numbers. I've gotten to see all the testing of the water coming from my ditch. And I know all my neighbors that have dogs, me included with two. I know all our neighbors that fertilize their yards. I know everything. And to watch the water quality that comes out of our just our, just our one neighborhood and the couple that are in line with us before it hits the inlet. And what we're putting in the inlet here is terrible. Well, I'll make it worse for pick, you. But, I'll make it worse for you. I live in Marietta, Georgia. Exactly. And it's hill country. Yep. So our neighbor's higher than we are. We're, our neighbor on the other side is lower than us, and then next to him is Little Bitty Creek. Now, my sister knows how much... I hate Roundup. In Florida, they want to make sure that if they have a hurricane, there's no impediment of the drainage of water out of the residential neighborhoods to get it into the ocean so that they aren't flooded out by a hurricane. So to take care of that, they use Roundup to so clean up. So they use Roundup to keep the canals clean. Right. So then they, get, they, get, they fill the canal with Roundup, and then they open the floodgates, and all that Roundup goes out on the grass flats, and all the grass flats turn to sandbars. Now, what makes you think your neighbors don't use Roundup? I know. I, I, I did. I, I'm not lying. I, I used it in, in, in a couple of my beds, and I used it around my fence. I did, but I didn't. I, I mean, but, I didn't. But, but what did you pay for the Roundup? $10? Uh, no, 30 $30? Aren't there any kids in your neighborhood, 15-year-olds? Oh, plenty of them. You need money to go to the movies with your girlfriend? I'll pay you $30 to weed this, my gardens. Right. 
It'll take you a couple hours. Just go, this is weeds. This all has to be hand pulled. Right. You got a little trowel and you dig in and you chop the roots off and you pull it. But you pay that kid $30 instead of about a roundup for $30. Yep. And you gave a kid a chance to get to make out with his girlfriend. <laughs> And you didn't kill the fish in the pond. And you're right. And you're right. And that, I mean, we, you're right. Now, here's a scarier one. They do studies of the fish in South Florida. They have treated water sewage outflows in the ocean on the edge of the Gulf Stream. Right. We're trying to ship it up to you so when you go marlin fishing, you can catch some of our sewer water. Perfect. But. They study these fish that are around the sewer outfalls. And you know what they've got in them? No telling. Birth control medications, uh, blue pill medication, uh, psycho drugs, you know, like for the uh, oh, yeah. psychotic people. Yeah. All these drugs are showing up in the fish. The bone fish in Biscayne Bay have got pharmaceuticals in them. A bone fish on Xanax. Yeah. Wow. But what happens when you get a bone fish on, on uh, birth control pills? D could it affect them? I don't know. But you exactly. certainly. Exactly. They weren't born that way. <laughs> no. No. The sewage, no. the treated sewage water being pumped into the ocean, is drugging the fish in the ocean. This is so deep. No pun intended, but I, I, you never think about that. Like, I mean, I, that, that is just a total different side of it that I would have never thought about. Even though the pollution has been, even though the sewage water has been treated, you still get that coming out of it. Well, they, they treat it for mostly for solids. Yeah, for solid waste. And solid waste doesn't include filtering out pharmaceuticals. Right. Wow. And by the way, just to change the subject in a sort of a way, you asked me earlier about the Bill Fish Foundation. Yep. And to tell you the truth, in my opinion, they're the number two reason to give money when you get blown out. You know you get blown out on Saturday when you were going to go fishing. Right. So, so you didn't buy $100 worth of trolling baits. So you didn't burn $1,000 worth of fuel. So you this, so you that. Take some of that money. If you said, you know what, all of my fishing trips are going to increase in cost by 10% because I'm going to send 10% to some worthy cause. And if you live in South Carolina, your most worthy cause would be the Billfish Foundation if you billfish. And it, it might be your chapter of the CCA or some organization like that. Right. Might be your cause. In South Florida... Or in Florida and in the nation today, probably the number one cause is cabins for clean, clean water. Because they got involved in that Alaska thing and they've gotten involved in some stream things and they're extremely involved in the water in Florida. Yep. And Captains for Clean Water is addressing the number one issue. Because as I said before, if you don't have estuaries and a clean environment you won't get plankton if you don't get plankton you won't get bait fish if you don't get bait fish you won't get big fish and when all of a sudden then you won't have any men hating chum nope <laughs> amen well i'll tell you what that's a great way to end it bouncer thank you so much for taking the time to sit with me this morning having breakfast and wish you the best of luck on your next um hang on i'm trying to go back and count one your next nine places that you have to visit between now and November 1st. And listen, if you enjoyed this podcast as much as I did and you want to get more information. Oh, I got to do one more thing. Hang on, we got to plug the books. Hang on, I'm plugging say, the books. Did you know number five came out no, last yes, week? Yes, no, no. Tell about number five real quick. All right, and then we're going to tell everybody how they can go find your books, okay? My books are at Amazon.com. That's right. Or you can mail order them from RJ Doyle Studios or from Cat Mary's Fishing Supply. But directly is Amazon. Uh, if you want to autograph, you got to catch me in my travels. I'll be in nine places in the next, <laughs> in the next week. but, two weeks. But at any rate, it's my fifth book. The reason we came out with the fifth book, fifth book was because Amazon is now offering us little people 
colored pitchers. Yep. So now we have the best of four books and a little bit of new stuff and colored pitchers. And it's dedicated to all the kids that I've been exposed to in my fishing career. Awesome. And I, and I saw uh, some great reviews about it. And, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I've got to add that to my collection. Um, I do have, I, I do own the previous four, by the way. Well, um, I know where you could get an autographed copy within seconds of here. It might be minutes because I won't be slow anymore. Here's what else we're going to do. Here's what else we're going to do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hit you up on that autograph copy, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make one of our listeners really, really happy. We're going to give one of our listeners, whoever we're listen, who, whoever's listening right now, go to TrilogyOutdoorsMedia at gmail.com, shoot me an email, and tell me why you feel like you need to get Bouncer's book. Send me a fish picture. I don't know. We're going to go through, and Bouncer and I will pick who we're going to send a book to. So we'll get a book autographed and... Um, We'll get some. I nomina- think a picture should almost be mandatory. We'll get okay. We want a picture, and, and it would be really, really special if that picture was a parent and a child. Child. All right. Even so here it, we go. Hang even, on. Even if it's a ninety-year-old and a fifty-year-old. There you go. So all right. So we're you're, you're listening to the guidelines. So it, we we need a parent-child picture, and, and if and if you happen to be in a budget that won't allow that, then a little story about you and your kid. There you go. A, a story about you and your kid, or you and your your parent, you yeah, and your yeah, parent, well and done. and how you got started in fishing, and uh, send it to us, and we're going to get you a copy of that book. We'll get it sent to you, and uh, you can enjoy. It. And I'll tell you what, go back and look at the other four books; they're all awesome. Trust me, you want to laugh your butt off, you want to read some great stories. This man has seen it all, and we thank him so much for sharing it with us. And thank you once again, Bouncer. Thanks for coming down. Spending the time here, and thanks for uh, making uh, you know our little quaint little uh, fishing village with a drinking problem, or drinking village with a fishing problem, whichever way you want to look at it. <laughs> one of your stops along your many travels well, of retirement. It's, it's fishing from sunrise to sunset, and then and it's drinking. It's a little bit of drinking yep. while you remember all the great fishing you had from sunrise to sunset. That is that is true, and I'm so glad that I don't uh, I do a lot more of the fishing part than the drinking part anymore these days. I love I love the fishing part. I, I enjoy the drinking part too, but not as much as I used to. But in listen, moderation, everything in moderation. Good in moderation, except for fishing. Except for fishing. No moderation. Yeah. All right. Well, we're gonna get out of here, and uh, y'all listen. TrilogyOutdoorsMedia.com. You can go check out everything. I'm gonna have all bouncers' information over there. Once again, how you can find the books and. Um, Remember, Saturday mornings, Southern Angus Radio Show, every eight, every Saturday morning, 8 to 10 on the Gator 107.9. Also, on all the uh, stands, newspaper stands, and online, you can check out the new magazine this month, Trilogy Outdoors Magazine. And uh, let's see, what else do we do? Uh, this podcast, Trilogy Outdoors, Captain's Felonious Reports. By the way, we're going to promise you in the next month we'll get you some new editions of Captain Spelonius reports out there but thank you guys all for listening in and remember you're going to find it here every week pins fur and feathers on trilogy outdoors podcast for over eight years gub world auctions has been solving surplus issues for municipalities and counties in south carolina and beyond their turnkey customer service has made them one of the best in the business here in the u.s and they are located right here in our home state of south carolina if you're looking for tractors heavy machines and vehicles just to name a few our partners at gub world have you covered the process is simple and their experts will come to you to inspect photograph and video all items before they make them available to everyone in the world for the bidding process. Gov World online auctions are supported by mailers, emails, and promotion to the biggest buyers in the country, and they get results and the highest dollar possible for your items. Don't go out of state to another auction company. Support business here in South Carolina and let Gov World get you top dollar for your items and put the money back in your city, municipality, or county. Give Gov World a call or visit their website govworld.com for more info and to set up a visit with one of their experts to get you in the next auction. Don't let valuable items just sit behind a fence. Give GovWorld a call and start turning them into money today. 
Trilogy Outdoors podcast is a product of Trilogy Outdoors Media. All views and opinions of our hosts and guests are not necessarily those of our sponsors. Trilogy Outdoors is produced and edited by Trilogy Outdoors Media. Be sure to follow us on all the podcast platforms as well as our social media pages on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And also, don't forget our other brands, Southern English Radio Show and Walk em All Outdoor Magazine. To find more information, visit TrilogyOutdoorsMedia.com. And remember, if it's anything dealing with fins, fur, and feathers, you're going to find it right here on Trilogy Outdoors.